The crisis on the Supreme Court today has multiple dimensions to it. It's not just the ethical crisis, which the whole country is talking about. It's the doctrinal and the political crises as well. These are interlocked and they're mutually reinforcing, and it all adds up to one profound crisis of constitutional legitimacy in the country. Now Donald Trump is bragging all over America that, quote, after 50 years of failure with nobody even coming close, I was able to kill Roe versus Wade, much to the shock of everyone. He and Mitch McConnell packed and stacked and gerrymandered the court. And now this right wing corporate court carefully designed to destroy Roe versus Wade and to fuse right wing religion with untrammeled corporate power has been demolishing women's abortion and contraceptive rights, civil rights law, voting rights law, civil liberties, environmental law, workers rights and consumer rights, enshrining government power over people whenever they conflict and corporate power over government whenever they conflict. The court has been behaving like a rabid partisan actor. House Oversight Committee progressives decided to take matters into their own hands and do what the Republican colleagues and fellow Democrats wouldn't do under their own volition, calling out the real power brokers in our country. Constitutional doctrine has been reduced in this court to a series of blatantly unjust and thoroughly ideological decisions like these, upholding white political supremacy, racial inequality, corporate power, and right-wing control over our democratic institutions. All of the preening lectures about textualism and originalism today are nothing but a fraud on the public. The right-wing justices, five of them named to the court by Bush and Trump, the two presidents elected in this century to the presidency after losing the popular vote, now act entirely like the judicial arm of the Republican Party, which represents a small minority of the American people. It's no coincidence that Justice Thomas takes millions of dollars from his right-wing corporate sugar daddies. After all, if you can decide presidential elections with 5-4 votes in Bush versus Gore, if you can pack, stack, and gerrymander not just Congress, but the Supreme Court itself by denying the other party even a hearing, why can't you have some friend of the court, some amicus curiae, fly you to Bali for vacation or pay for your family member's private school tuition or buy you a recreational vehicle or send you on a lavish, all-expense-paid vacation? Why the hell not? And yet, with their lopsided ideological jurisprudence assaulting the rights of the people and with their obscene ethical transgressions, they've completely forfeited their right to be called justice. And unless I forget to do it from now on, they're just Judge Alito and Judge Thomas to me at best. Jamie Raskin was on fire during this rant and did a masterful job of linking the laughably corrupt Supreme Court to the dark forces shaping our entire political system, right? Here's the thing, money in politics is inherently undemocratic because it shifts the power away from the voters and into the hands of the highest bidder. Do I need to cite examples? We're talking about Citizens United, lobbying, super PACs, corporate subsidies, campaign donations, or how about a kickback? If you pass this legislation, right, that's going to help our business, or help my brand, yeah, I'll slide you some money on the table. And the other thing that people need to recognize is that having money in politics is simply a feature of capitalism. It's not a bug. And the corruption that we have been witnessing is the logical end of capitalism. So all of this shouldn't be as surprising as it's coming off to be. I took a look at the five to four decisions in which the conservative majority was unified but couldn't attract uh, one of the other votes. And there were 60-some decisions in which that was the count and an issue obviously relevant to a Republican special interest was involved, they won every single time. It is a pattern that any good lawyer would take into court to prove bias, and the other side would probably settle. So the pattern is very, very telling. It's also very telling that Senator Whitehouse, as well as activists, nonprofits, think tanks, other members of Congress, etc., have been ringing the alarm on this for so long, yet no one has taken the issue as seriously as it deserved to be until it was far too late. Dark money is the rot in our democracy right now, 
It is controlled by definition by billionaires and wealthy special interests who have the ability to spend millions and millions of dollars in politics, the motive to spend millions and millions of dollars in politics, and the desire to obscure from the public who they are when they spend it so they can't be held accountable for their political intervention. It's a concerted effort. It's a set of sort of dark money cords that are uh, presenting an argument in harmony to the justices. And then if there's one consistency uh, with the right-wing justices, it's their alignment with the direction provided by those dark money front groups. This is the court that dark money built. And it built it through contributions to the Republican Party. It built it through front groups that were stood up that don't reveal who their real funding is, um, but that then go out and lobby for issues, file amicus briefs for issues, in many cases litigate cases as the real party in interest. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is up to more shenanigans. This time, his connection to foreign adversarial governments has seemingly been confirmed. I rise today to introduce articles of impeachment against Associate Justices of the Supreme Court Clarence Thomas and Samuel Anthony Alito, Jr. Against Justice Thomas, the resolution includes three total articles, one count of failure to disclose financial income, gifts, reimbursements, property interest liabilities, and transactions, among other information, and two counts of refusal to recuse from matters concerning his spouse's legal and financial interests before the court. Two Democratic senators, Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island and Ron Wyden of Oregon, sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland asking him to appoint a special counsel to investigate likely undisclosed gifts and income from Thomas's known friend and associate billionaire Harlan Crow and other donors. The senators alleged that Thomas may have committed tax fraud by accepting and failing to disclose gifts worth potentially millions of dollars. So we already know about Harlan Crow. That was a huge headline when the connection between Crow and Thomas was first reported. But the problem isn't necessarily the gifts themselves. As Thomas said, many of the gifts were personal hospitality from close friends. It's understandable that when you're a Supreme Court justice, you would have friends in higher places, friends like Harlan Crow. The problem is the fact that he, a law practitioner at the absolute top of his field, failed to disclose the gifts properly, if at all. In the letter from the senators, they disclose a list of likely undisclosed gifts and income from Harlan Crow and affiliate companies and other donors. Most notably, it's been revealed that Thomas allegedly took a yacht trip to Russia and the Baltics, which included a helicopter ride to Yusupov Imperial Palace in St. Petersburg back in 2003. St. Petersburg also happens to be Vladimir Putin's hometown, but there are no details as to what Thomas was doing at the palace or who he met with. As far as how he may have gotten away with keeping this trip concealed for over 20 years, Ukrainian-American activist Igor Sushko posits that Thomas likely entered and exited Russia on an oligarch's yacht in the Gulf of Finland, so his U.S. passport wouldn't have a record of visiting Russia. In the request for the investigation, the senator said this, we do not make this request lightly. The evidence assembled thus far plainly suggests that Justice Thomas has committed numerous willful violations of federal ethics and false statement laws and raises significant questions about whether he and his wealthy benefactors have complied with their federal tax obligations. Presented with opportunities to resolve questions about his conduct, Justice Thomas has maintained a suspicious silence. No government official should be above the law. We therefore request that that you appoint a special counsel authorized to investigate potential criminal violations by Justice Thomas. They also mentioned that the full scope of these non-disclosures is still unknown. So the bad news is that we have a rogue court that has been captured by special interests and that is over and over again in appalling pattern, continuing to follow uh, the direction of the billionaires and the front group through which they operate. Uh, the good news is that the public is fed up, Congress is fed up mostly, and 
the Judicial Conference is beginning to tighten up the rules on the Supreme Court justices. I'll close by pointing out that the case is often made that Congress has nothing to say about regulating the ethical conduct of the Supreme Court justices. The Supreme Court justices' own behavior belies that notion. When the first round of Harlan Crow to Clarence Thomas gifts of free yacht and jet travel came out back in 2010, 11, and 12, those questions were referred where? To the Judicial Conference, a body established by Congress. For what? For review under the disclosure laws passed by Congress. And through all of that process, we had a judge who was involved in that point out weaknesses in the process at the time, but what didn't happen in that process was for Justice Thomas or any of the other Supreme Court justices to say, wait a minute, you have no authority over me. I am not subject to the disclosure rules. You cannot investigate me. There's even a, a remedy if it looks like the failure to disclose was willful for a referral to the Attorney General for a proper full investigation. And that question, whether the Harlan Crow to Justice Thomas second round of yacht and jet travel gifts should be referred is before the Judicial Conference right now. Meanwhile, Democratic Representative from New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, announced earlier this week that she's introduced articles of impeachment against both Thomas and his conservative colleague, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito. The articles also accuse the justices of failing to disclose gifts from wealthy donors, and Thomas is further accused of failing to recuse himself from cases where he had a demonstrated conflict of interest. In a statement, she said, Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito's pattern of refusal to recuse from consequential matters before the court in which they hold widely documented financial and personal entanglements constitutes a grave threat to American rule of law, the integrity of our democracy, and one of the clearest cases for which the tool of impeachment was designed. Justice Thomas and Alito's repeated failure over decades to disclose that they received millions of dollars in gifts from individuals with business before the court is explicitly against the law. Congress has a legal, moral, and democratic obligation to impeach. Will the impeachment work? It's highly unlikely. There is no reason for Republican Congress people in either the House or the Senate to vote to remove a conservative justice from the bench. And we already know how the Supreme Court, with a few notable exceptions, feels about bribes or gratuities, as they call it. With the current system, there is no incentive for Thomas or Alito to step down from their positions. And if they don't do it themselves, who's going to make them? They already seem immune to public pressure because usually they're the ones issuing judgment on other similarly embroiled officials. They're so well protected on that bench that they hardly even demonstrate remorse whenever allegations such as these turn up. What's the point? They don't need to curry favor with the public. We didn't vote for them. They're never going to run a re-election campaign. We pay their salaries, but only because we don't have much of a choice in the matter, there is very little that we can do to them. But the president could do something if he really wanted to, if it was justified. He hasn't yet, but he could. And if it wasn't already completely obvious that there needed to be some kind of reformation of the Supreme Court, it's pretty clear now. At the very absolute least, can we at least just get rid of these lifetime appointments? And sure, appoint the special counsel, run the probe, file the articles, do the due diligence, and then do something actually meaningful at the end of it all. This government is completely unsustainable with one of its three branches completely rogue. And that's not to say that the other two branches are in fine working order at the moment, but if the 21st century has taught us anything, it's that our systems are not impenetrable, they are not infallible, they are prone to corruption, and they need to be strengthened.